Shalem Brownstone is a 2009 graphic novel co-written by Nikhil Singh and John Harris Dunning and illustrated by Nikhil Singh. The book has received moderately good reviews and has a small following and even received praise from masterminds by Alan Moore. However, more modern critics have commented that the generally gorgeous artwork by Nikhil Singh has caused many to overlook the narrative problems and the cliches that affect the quality of the book overall. The focus on the artwork can be seen by the praise the book has received. It has been described as a tactile visual joy by The Guardian, a seamless relationship between the images and the text by the new Minghella. Your eyes demand time to caress each swirling curl and line by Metro, and a beautiful looking graphic novel. The artwork is gorgeous, intricate, and stylish by SFX Magazine. Very few of these comments are about the story, characters, or anything that happens in the book. This doesn't mean that the story is off, but it's not on the same level of quality as the artwork or even the quality of other independent novels. The purpose of this essay is to decide whether Shell and Brownstone has the following that it does because of the input of the illustrator Nicole Singh or because it acts generally great writing. Furthermore, the intention is in no way to demean anyone who enjoys Shell and Brownstone or even its story. Whether you choose to love a product for only a handful of its aspects is completely fine, because almost every critic does praise the artwork as, as some of the best in years. I believe this book stood out at the time considering the civilized nature of DC and Marvel art styles, where the art had to be drawn extremely fast just to compete with their deadline. Artists like Dave McKean, who worked with the literary graphic novel icons like Neil Gaiman and started to work for Dark Horse Comics. Talk with Fallen that orally transitioned from mainstream DC and Marvel media and began working with Image Comics. Finally, Rob Liefeld, who was the face of the, of the comic pulp media in the 2000s, already started work on Deadpool, and his artwork has been ridiculed and memed by the internet for decades now. So, when Salem Brownstone was released, a book with so much artistic detail, nuance, and along with a Never be seen for cartoon Shuila style in comic books, natural fans of the comic book medium would have naturally gravitated to such a dreamlike, fanciful, and unique setting, considering whatever big companies were producing at the time. One may even argue that a Shuila style created a ripple effect throughout the comic industry. As early a few years later, DC released the series Penguin Pain and Prejudice which employs a similar graphic shadow-based art style and the novel Harleen, which also uses Surrealist elements to tell its story. The point being that Selim Brownstone really had an impact on the comic industry, and as well as its audience, and an impact which is still affecting our modern media today. Though we'll be specifically criticizing the writing, I will say with a little hesitation that all praise given the artwork is earned. Hence, let's continue with the main flaw of the book, the writing or more specifically the characterization of Salem Brownstone himself. Nikhil stated in an interview that Salem, rather being based on one particular character, was a conglomeration of all the comic characters which she felt to be iconic. In doing so, creating a character that was familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. The design philosophy can be applied to the design of the curved eyebrows and his slick hair. However, I believe that in doing this, the writers crafted a character that was a little too generic for anyone to relate to, and does not have a clear arc throughout the novel. On the opening page, there is an aspect telling us about the life of Salem Brownstone and how he was hungry for more in life, which automatically displays the problem of the story not showing and instead telling characterization to his audience. During the first few moments of the story, Salem is being driven in a cab to his estranged father's house which he has just inherited. He reminisces about the fact that he always wished to know his father and now does not have the chance to do so. He explores his new house while pulling on his father's old cloak, admiring the uncanny taxidermies plastered all around the house, foreshadowing the weird and fantastical world that he will be dragged into. The setup here is very similar to other YA novels and familiar hero adventurer tropes. Such as a child who is brought into the fantastical world due to having special powers or powerful parents who dissociated their children from their fantastical world for either safety or responsibility. And can be described as a basic premise as the Worst Wits series, the Harry Potter series, 
the Percy Jackson series, the Winx Saga, the Shadow Hunter Saga, and many other adventure novels. This recycling of tropes can be attributed to creating a character that was familiar. But I feel like the focus on this aspect distracts and detracts the creators from fur fleshing out Sam's character and scissoring him from all these other versions. Some moments of an original personality are there in some aspects of the story, such as when Sam was told by the terrified contortionist to run. He simply takes out his flask, throws it into the dark, and ignites it rather nonchalantly to reveal the shadows that wish to prey on him. The artwork suggests that Sam has a more laid-back and blasé attitude towards the whole situation, which would help to separate him from Harry Potter and Percy Jackson in some way. However, there's a certain lack of these distinctive moments in the book as the characterization of Salem is put on hold to keep the plots moving forward. Speaking of which, Salem, unlike his Harry Potter and Percy Jackson counterparts, does not have much agency as a character. To explain, uh, an energetic or proactive protagonist is a character that actively partakes in the events in order to move the story forward, showing their proactivity and individuality as a character. However, Shalem shows very little agency in the story. He's told what to do by other characters in the story, and does not have the opportunity to learn about his new world by himself and make his own decisions. The problem here is that Selim is being dragged around by the plot and only reacts to the story's events instead of engaging or causing them. The main issue with this is that Selim doesn't leave much of an impact on the reader and remains uninteresting. Considering that Selim's name is the title of the book, this is of course a huge problem. Poor characterization even extends to the side characters. Nick Hill described Cassandra in the original script as you're sort of as this busty blonde girl interest, and that she wanted to take a fresh approach with her. If this is an ample evidence that the, even the illustrator is aware of the uninspired characterization of some of the characters in the book, Nick Hill Singh then goes on to state that he felt Cassandra was a stereotypical typical image which was far too common in many comics. At the time, Hence, Nick Hill made the wise decision to draw Cassandra as a contortionist. Hence, all the memorable art of her in her weird, fantastical positions. It should be noted that many fans often forgot Cassandra's name and simply referred to her as the most impactful and interesting aspect of her character being a contortionist. Suggesting that the only reason people remember Cassandra at all, besides Salem's mental and love interest, is because of Nicholson's input. Here we can see a pattern of Nicholson being the main creative force behind most of the decisions, by adding unique design details to the archetypes of Salem Brownstone and the stereotypical Cassandra. Finally, I would like to comment on the amount of non recurring characters in the story that do not play a major role in it. Characters like the Mentor, the Beast in the Shadow World, the Monkey Girl E.T.T. While these characters are beautifully designed and realized by artist Nick Hill, many of them are not utilized in the fabric of the story and only mean to deliver exposition, particularly the Mentor character. The problem being, their presence only means to distract the viewers from the plot by reducing the pacing to a halt. Such a problem could have been solved by allowing him to figure out this expositional information by himself, allowing the audience to absorb the information naturally and efficiently. Furthermore, by allowing Sam to investigate himself, could allow, it could allow us to see how Selim processes information and may have provided some more characterization for him. Of course, these aspects are not present in the book. This can only be, this can only be described as a missed opportunity. If you have read Salem Brownstone, along with any of the additional information about Nicholas Singh or about John Harris Dunning, then you know that I have been dancing around the artist. You are likely aware of why a story of such popularity has so many more narrative issues. John Harris Dunning has only been credited with writing three other comic books, Tumult in 2018, Comics Unmasked, Art and Anarchy in the UK in 2014, 
and Salem Brownstone in 2009. Essentially, Salem Brownstone was the first official comic book he ever published, which explains a lot of the amateurish structuring in the book as well as the cliché stereotypical character. He's mostly known for writing the heat graphic novel Tomot, received critically and financially well. Tomot was written a full nine years after Salem Brownstone, which gave John more than ample time to refine and perfect his writing style. Hence, most readers overlook the narrative flaws in Salem, because they are aware that this is essentially the work of a beginning and up coming writer. Furthermore, you may question why a relatively unknown artist like Nikhil Singh was able to produce artwork of this caliber. According to the About the Office section of the book, she spent seven, seven, seven years, 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 years perfecting the art here. Not even Marvel's best artists put this amount of assured effort in their art, and the results really reflect that. Hence, people are less willing to criticize Selen Brownstone because they are aware of the absurd amount of love, care, and passion that went into it. One may be irked by the fact that such brilliant artwork wasn't put to a story that could match it in quality, but many digress as your original work is still referenced, talked about, and beloved by today. Not to mention, Salem Brownstone probably allowed Nicholson to produce the artwork for Taddy Went West, which had a more now to merit to back it up with the amazing artwork. As of now, she has moved away from drawing comics and pursued to write her own psychedelic noir thriller club, Death, as well as a few other books discussing the nature of computing, which has also received really well by critics. So if Providing a moderate portion of a light to a very flawed book was necessary for her to move on to her sad career and critical acclaim, then one may be said that it was worth it for her in the long run. Salem Brownstone is not an awful book. I could go into some of the better written aspects of the book. Ed Harms' art, the humor, the interesting world building, the palpable threat of the shadows. But for a time, and relatively reasons, we will not discuss them today. I do not even mean to discredit Dunning Axera, as his work massively improved years after Salem Brownstone. This essay is probably being written in celebration of these two creators, and what they brought to the page while still maintaining a sense of objective criticism as well. 